Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. A quick warning before we begin. This episode contains graphic descriptions of sexual assault. So listen with care. The crime is horrific. The details are as bad as you can imagine. The woman at the center of it all, though, exhibiting simply incredible bravery under the worst possible circumstances. A woman at the center of a mass rape trial that shocked France has taken it to the stand in court. Giselle Pellicou's ex-husband has admitted drugging her and inviting dozens of men to rape her while she was unconscious. The 72-year-old arrived at court earlier to give evidence against him and other men on trial. The rape trial of Giselle Pellicou's husband and 50 other men has transfixed the world. Not simply because of the crime itself, but because of the way Giselle has wrestled the narrative away from the ones the world all too often hears in the coverage and discussion of sexual assault. She faces 50 more men on trial accused of rape, which many of them deny. Some choose to hide their faces as they walk in and out, unlike Giselle Pellico, who waived her right to anonymity so that this case could be heard by the world. She felt that she wasn't the one who should be ashamed and that her aggressors should be ashamed for what they did to her. She's somehow uh, fighting for every woman and in order to, to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Today, we will take you inside that courtroom with a reporter who has been covering the trial to explain exactly what's happening within those walls and within the justice system of France, but also the impact of this case well beyond that. Because Giselle Pellico's bravery may change more than just narratives. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Catherine Porter is a Canadian reporter working as an international correspondent for The New York Times, where she has been in France covering this trial. Hello, Catherine. Hi there. Thank you so much for finding a little time for us. I know um, this is a busy period in this trial, I guess. Well, I I mean, every reporter's busy. (laughs) Thank you for having (laughs) me, though. I'm happy to share this story with your listeners. Well, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about the woman at the center of this? Who is uh, Giselle Pellico and uh, why has she become uh, such an important figure? Well, up until basically September, almost no one in France knew who she was. She was not a public figure, not a well-known figure. She's a grandmother turning 72 next month, was working in uh, the Paris region as a manager for a big company and long time married to her, her sweetheart from her late teens and they had three kids and seven grandkids. And in about 2013, she retired from her job. She was the main breadwinner uh, in her family. And she and her husband moved down to the small town outside of Avignon to retire. And the reason she's become very well known is that her husband, Dominique Pellico, has pled guilty to having drugged her and invited other men to join him in raping her in their retirement house when she was in a comatose drugged state. The trial started in September, and Giselle made the unusual decision, unusual, I think, internationally, to waive her right to a private trial. She decided she wanted to make it public. And not only is her husband, who's pled guilty, being tried in this trial, But 50 other men are being tried at the same time. All but one are charged with either raping her, assaulting her, or attempting to sexually assault her. But the vast majority are, in fact, for raping her while she had been drugged. And so since then, she made this very brave decision to open the trial to the public by stating that she wanted shame to change sides, that she should not feel ashamed walking into the courtroom. But the men 
who come into the courtroom every day are the ones who should feel ashamed. And there needed to be a cultural shift in France. And she hoped it could be a public education for women who wake up in the morning without remembering what happened the night before, that they might think of her and think that perhaps they have been drugged. Or other women who have been raped might might also think about her and uh, decide to report to police or also, you know, just take a step uh, against uh, rape culture, which is not a term she would use, but has become increasingly common in the French media. Right. So for that reason, she's become, you know, over the weeks, it started slowly, but that courtroom and the overflow courtroom has been packed with journalists from around the world, but also with regular French citizens who line up every day to watch. And sometimes they bring her flowers, they often applaud her when she comes in, and they always applaud her at this point when she leaves the courtroom. She's become a kind of feminist hero in the country, and and her name has traveled around the world. And we'll get back to what could be the lasting impact of this trial. But first, and, you know, we we warned our listeners off the top, could you maybe explain a little bit more about uh, how this happened? I mean, it seems unfathomable that it could be her husband behind it all. Like, can you just explain what we know and how how he was caught? I mean, so much about this trial is unfathomable. It's, it's, it's as they say in French, hors norme, it's like... A, extraordinary in a horrifying sense. Yeah. You know, from the fact that it's her husband to the numbers, to the breadth of these men and how they really represent a full spectrum of middle and working class, small town French society. Um, These are men who are, many of them are married, children, some are grandchildren. They range from their 20s up until the 70s. They have all sorts of different jobs. Very few of them are unemployed, um, from prison guard to nurse to construction workers. Many of them have had their wives or loved ones come and speak on their behalf uh, to testify of their about their character. So that has been shocking. And how this case came before the courts or came before the police is also really surprising. So during 2020, Giselle Pellicot, who had been struggling with some symptoms that she did not know and no one had diagnosed as drug poisoning, but she was having blackouts. She had stopped driving because she was worried about these blackouts. She'd wake up late in the day rather than the morning and have absolutely no memory of the day before. And her family, including her husband, at least publicly to his family, were worried that she was getting on the onset of Alzheimer's or some kind of brain tumor. She was going to visit doctors. She went to help with her grandkids outside of town. She took the train to go up to Paris. And while she was away for a couple of weeks, her husband was arrested in September in a supermarket where he was caught filming up the skirts of three three women who were shopping this in this supermarket. And the security guard stopped him and stopped one of the women and said, look, we've been looking at this guy on our cameras. He's been filming up your skirt. I've called the cops. You need to file a police complaint. And these three women did so, uh, which is by itself quite remarkable because if you've ever, you know, had to do that and file a police complaint, it, it often takes, you know, a long time out of your day. And these women and the security guard might have thought, oh, okay, he's an old, he's an old dude. He's in his 70s and he maybe is a bit of a pervert, but he's just harmless. Right. But they went through with it and the police came. And when they collected his two cell phones and they got his computer from home. They started to see evidence of interactions he was having on a website, which was called Coco.fr. Um, it's a s- sort of horrific uh, website that's been since shut down where you would pay a, a small amount of money for a membership to exchange with other people. And um, police shut it down because it had a lot of pornography and child pornography and sex trafficking on it. They saw evidence of him exchanging with other men, discussing about drugging his wife and bringing them over. And they also saw 
the kind of digital residue or footprint residue of photos that they didn't have access to, but the titles were all, you know, things like Manuel rapes Giselle this night, uh, and they were dated with the terms rapes and his wife. And so they arrested him, and they started a huge investigation. You know, they let him go at first, and, and later they called Giselle to come in when he was supposed to come in, and they both believed it was going to be some kind of administrative checkup. But that's when they, they fully arrested him and charged him for, for a slew of charges he faces. And they got access to a hard drive on which they found around 20,000 photos and videos documenting rapes of his wife by him and a multitude of other men. And over the following months, police were able to use those photos as well as exchanges he had on Skype mostly with men to track down these men and arrest them. They had a list of 83 suspects. In the end, they could identify around 54 or so And they ended up arresting 50, uh, and one is on the run. And you mentioned that these men are a cross-section of society and that this is a small town on the outskirts of Avignon. Can you explain what that's done to the town? What's it like there uh, since this story broke? So it's a little town, and it's like in Provence, which is one of the most picturesque parts of France. It's the one that, you know, when you dream of going to France for a summer holiday, it's where you want to go with the lavender fields and the olive groves and the and the scrubby mountains uh, and the gorgeous wine. So, you know, m- very few of the men came from Mazan. They came from a 60-kilometer radius around Mazan. So they came from many, many small towns, as well as, you know, a few from a- Avignon and as far as Lyon, and they came as far away from Lyon, they would drive for two and a half hours, although most of them came within a 60-kilometer radius of that town. The town is a picturesque town set on a little hilltop in view of a very windswept, beautiful mountain surrounded by vineyards and olive orchards. And a third of the town is retirees because it's in the south, the weather's great, you have amazing walking in the area, and you're within a, you know, a very short d- drive to Avignon, which has a fabulous summer theater festival. So you have all this culture nearby that particularly Parisians would like access to, as well as uh, a fast train station to Paris. It only takes you two and a half hours, more or less. The perfect place for a quiet retirement. Amazing place to retire. So the Pelicos had retired there. They weren't super active in terms of retirement life. They hadn't joined a whole bunch of clubs. So they, they didn't know, you know, they weren't well known in town. And very few of the men came from the town. You know, we know of a couple that were from Mazan. The rest were from nearby. But if you're from there, you know a lot of other people from other towns. And, you know, when you have 51 people who have been accused of this and 15 of them are so jailed already, the word gets out pretty quickly. And there were lists of names that were circulated of the accused. And many people in town, or some at least, told me that they know at least one of the people on that list. Mm -hmm. So it's creepy. Um, They find it super creepy, um, as I think everybody would. The mayor has come out swinging because of the media onslaught on this town and the reputation of the town. He's been very defensive, and it caused a bit of a scandal. He had an interview with the BBC in which he seemed to really downplay what had happened to Jesus. And sort of say, well, she hadn't been killed and, you know, it could have been worse. It was a pretty um, maladroit, clumsy uh, attempt to protect the reputation of his town, but it caused an uproar. But many people in town feel like it's not fair that the town is now linked to this horrible episode. And there is some anger about that. But there's also 
you know, a huge amount of sympathy and horror. I went to the town for a march to support Gisèle Pellicot. And, you know, the people in that march spoke very eloquently about how, how horrified they are, like everyone in France. And it's a very rare case because usually, as we know, most rape cases are between people who know one another. And it's almost never you have proof. Whereas in this case, there's a library of videos and photos. So it's a very different case that changes the language a bit about rape and the conceptions. And it's it's rattling. One thing that I found interesting in town is that particularly women felt very touched by this because it happened in their neighborhood. And whether or not they knew her, they could feel it because it was close. So they could imagine where the men were parking when they walked to the house and go by the house. I talked to a woman her age who said, you know, I used to walk my dog by the house. And, you know, this didn't happen on the other side of the world. This happened here, two blocks from where I live. And she and other women said it It's made me change the way I look at people when I go to the post office. When I go to the market, I'm looking at men wondering, is this the kind of stuff you do? It's really broken this, you know, old rape myth that rapists are creepy, you know, outcasts who attack you in a parking lot at night and reminded people that, you know, rape is is much more common than you realize. And often it's you know, people who you think of as your wonderful neighbor or your fabulous soccer coach or the guy who's stocking groceries in your local grocery store. It's not some creepy dude who jumps out of the bushes a la Paul Bernardo. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, that she wanted to have a public trial. That, I guess, is not the only thing uh, that she's insisted on. Can you just describe, uh, you know, her behavior in the courtroom and outside of it, including advocating for some of this evidence to be displayed? Yeah, she's a remarkable woman. I mean, watching her is, I'm very impressed with her. I think every journalist in the room, everyone in the room is pretty impressed with her. At the beginning of the trial, when she uh, first spoke, I think it was the second day or second or third day of the trial, she said, my life, you know, I look on the outside well put together, but inside as a field of ashes. My life is destroyed. And it's true. I mean, imagine she had been married to the same person for 50 years. In her words, a love of her life. So she's not just dealing with, you know, all of these strange men in a room who are charged with raping her, but this incredible betrayal of uh, by her husband who would drive her to the medical appointments that they made in order to to meet with specialists for her memory gaps and other STDs that she got. So her whole life has shattered. Her whole conception of herself has shattered. Her conception of her family has shattered. And yet she arrives each day, mostly between her two lawyers, her head high, a small smile on her face, serene. She sits through the testimony of these men and her husband, mostly serene, mostly not losing her cool. She basically appears like dignity embodied to me Hmm. as a writer, I've covered rape often, and I would also often write about, you know, the the perfect rape victim and how there was no such thing. In some ways, she is the perfect rape victim. She's a grandmother. She'd only ever been with her husband and one other man in her whole life, mm-hmm. you know, and usually people get picked apart for their sexual history, even if there's a rape shield law, it comes up often. So she's, in many ways, she's very relatable. She's dignified. She's graceful. She doesn't wear much makeup, but she's quite, you know, she's appealing to look at. So she has all these things that make her, you know, and add to, to I think, her symbol in France. And as you asked, she, she not only demanded that the, that, you know, testimony be open, which I will say, you know, was her right as a victim in France, but that many of the defense lawyers of the accused fought against it. They did not want this to be open because it's hard on them and their families um, to have their names in the paper. Also, even if it's just in some papers, it's just first name here in France. 
But she also fought to have these photos and videos broadcast into the courtroom in which you see the evidence of what happened to her. And she had to fight twice for it. First she won, and then the head judge decided it was too difficult and it was harming and pinging on the dignity of the courtroom and was unnecessary. And she appealed through her lawyers and said, one of her lawyers said, I think very memorably, that we, we need to look rape in the eyes, straight in the eyes. You know, and she wanted this evidence to be shown. She didn't want to be made to feel embarrassed by it. And she wanted people to really look at what it looks like. Tell me more about uh, what it's like when that evidence goes up. It's surreal. It's uncomfortable in the courtroom because you see her like a, you know, a deeply sleeping rag doll of a person. She has no, you know, she her mouth is open. Often the room is filled with the sound of her snores. She is snoring. And the men that I have watched, the videos I have watched while it was there are men who are trying to be very quiet. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because it gets uncomfortable in the courtroom. Some of the videos that are longer, they're only a minute's long. They're not super long. But after a certain amount of time, you know, you just don't want to watch anymore because it is like it's feels it is really uncomfortable. It's kind of obscene because she's so obviously powerless and vulnerable and asleep, like dead asleep. And yet she sits there and she she usually puts her head down um, and doesn't watch the videos, but she she stays in the room. Even though I think to anybody following this trial or just listening to you uh, speak about it, it seems like uh, the most open and shut of open and shut cases. But this trial is still going on. What is happening now? What kind of defense is being used and what happens next? So, you know, even if you plead guilty in France, there's a trial, you know, as her husband has, uh, because the court system is sort of one that's set up for uh, the country or the judicial system of the country to understand what happened and find the truth. It's not a contract type of law between two people. Hmm. So um, we believe around 15 of the 51 men who have been charged have pled guilty. And the rest have said that they're not guilty. But uh, none of them contest that they went to the Pelico's home and that they had sexual relations with Giselle. And none, or almost none at least, contest that she was, you know, drugged since uh, they say, for the most part, that they were lured there by Mr. Pelico under false pretenses, that he had asked them to come and have a menage a trois with him and his wife in their place, and that she was pretending to sleep. For the most part, there's variations of this, right? Um, But many of them say they believed she was pretending to sleep, or, you know, she was nervous and had taken a few drugs herself beforehand to calm herself down, and they were doing some kind of role play, you know, that she would wake up. And they had no idea that her husband had drugged them. So they say that they had no intention to rape her, that in some ways they had not consented to raping her, that they thought they were there for a a sexual adventure a la trois. The thing that Dominique Pellicot says is he has repeated time and time again in the courtroom that all of the men knew that he had made it very clear to them And he had also given them rules. Not all of them had these rules, but many did, that they were to park a certain distance away so the neighbors wouldn't notice their cars, that they were to get naked in the kitchen um, so that their clothing would be accessible if she was to stir and they had to bolt and leave the room quickly, that they would warm their hands up either on a radiator or under hot water if it was cold out, that they would not have smoked or put on any kind of um, perfume before coming. Um, And he says that this is sort of proof that they all knew that uh, very well what the deal was. And that is sort of the axis around which this trial is turning um, in most cases. Now, most legal experts who I've spoken to say, you know, according to French law, It will be very hard for these men not to be found guilty, particularly given the video evidence. But 
you know, um, they face up to 20 years in jail, and perhaps some of their arguments will, will greatly reduce their sentence. We will see. It is a very fine line to tread to, because when you see these videos, you see how asleep she is. Uh-huh. And even, you know, one of the lawyers said to me, the real question is not how they got into the room, but what they did once they were in the room. And many of the questions are around, interestingly, consent in the courtroom. The main judge asks each man, well, did you, did you ask her if she was consenting? Did you talk to her? Did you have any communication with Ms. Giselle Pellico to ensure that she was, she was game for all of this? And in all cases, the answer is no. And it turns out that there's no consent in the law in France like there is in Canada. But still, that idea of being tricked Many of them are asked, okay, well, if you were tricked, did you, did you call the cops later? When you left the house and, and had this feeling that something was wrong, what did you do? Did you tell anyone? Did you try and help her? And none of the men, no one called the police. Now, many of them have said um, they were scared. You know, they were having these sexual liaisons outside of marriage and they didn't want their wives to know or they didn't believe the police would believe them or, or other, other reasons. What does happen now? What's the lasting impact here? And uh, when will we know for sure that uh, they're guilty? Well, the trial goes till mid-December. We don't know when a verdict will come out um, and when the sentencing will happen. But the trial is expected to go until mid-December. It will be a marathon of closing statements because there are something like 40, 40 lawyers. I mean, it's just a, a massive legal presence. The lasting impact, I mean, cultural shifts are are hard to see in real time. But I will tell you that this um, has been, I mean, the biggest story in France since the Olympics. It is something that people are talking about constantly. It's in the newspapers. Uh, There are op-eds about it constantly. There has been a move by some to change the definition of rape in the penal code to include consent. And this has sped up that debate. Whether that happens or not is a question because there's real opposition to it too here in France. You know, I I think though this will be a case that will, you know, mark the country. There has been a mobilization of a myriad of feminist groups demanding more money to support victims, to put uh, sex education in schools, which has been mandated in France since 2001, but has never really been implemented in a serious way, to increase funding for women's groups and the like. We will see long term how this changes things. I mean, already we've heard that the number of people uh, reporting that they believe they were drugged, not by a stranger in a bar, by but someone in their homes, has shot up in France. I think there'll be lots of longer term repercussions from this trial and the sort of daily consciousness raising this, this trial has been for the country because people have been following it day by day. You've gotten to see 50 different cases in one and it has really sparked a debate. Catherine, thank you so much for this and uh, for the work you've done covering this trial. It's uh, like I said, it's unfathomable. Thanks very much for having me. Catherine Porter reporting from France for The New York Times. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. To send us feedback, you can email hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. Or you can call us and leave a voicemail at 416-935-5935. You can find us wherever you get podcasts. You can find us on your smart speaker by asking it to play the Big Story podcast. And if you're interested in checking out something different, you can find us on Seeker. That's S-E-E-K-R. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.